What if I told you that you could make a pigeon superstitious? You can, and I'm going to explain to you how. I'm Dr. Kion West of the Institute of Psychological Sciences at the University of Leeds, and I'm going to talk to you about a single paper called Superstition in the Pigeon, published by B.F. Skinner in 1948. To explain how I'll make a pigeon superstitious, I'd have to explain four things to you. The first would be what operant conditioning is. The second would be what a Skinner box is. The third would be what a reward schedule is. And then the fourth will be applications to pigeons. The fifth will be applications to ourselves to explain how you make people superstitious as well. So what is operant conditioning? Operant conditioning is what psychologists call training or any activity in which you encourage a kind of behavior or discourage another kind of behavior. The principles of operant conditioning are fairly straightforward. They involve either a reinforcement or a punishment and either giving something or taking something away. Just so you get the terminology of operant conditioning correctly, I'll walk you through it a little bit right now. As you can see in the table I've put up, if something encourages behavior, it's called reinforcement. Whether you give something or take something away to encourage behavior, that's reinforcement. So if, for example, someone does something you like and you give them a good grade or you give them money, that's called reinforcement. If they do something that you don't like and you try to stop them from doing it, so let's say you're a parent and you take away their television privileges, or you give them a good spanking, not that I'm encouraging that, but that's called a punishment. It discourages the behavior. If you look at the table now, we're focusing on giving versus taking away. So if you give something, that's called positive, whether or not the thing you're giving is actually considered positive by normal standards. So giving money, giving a spanking, these are both called positive taking away money or taking away television privileges or taking away something that they don't like, like taking away an aversive noise or taking away the fact that they have to eat vegetables every day. That would be called negative, whether they like it or not. When you put these terms together, then you can understand what operant conditioning does in terms of rewards and punishment and giving and taking. That's where you get terms like positive reinforcement and negative punishment or positive punishment and negative reinforcement. Today, we'll be talking about positive reinforcement because that's what we'll be using in the Skinner box. So what is a Skinner box? A Skinner box is a way that you can train an animal, normally, to do something that you want. It follows the same rules of operant conditioning, except that it's a very controlled environment where we know exactly what we'll be giving the animal and exactly what the animal wants and exactly what behaviors the animal will do before we give them the reward. So if you imagine that that box is your Skinner box, and the animal I'll be using today, obviously, will be a pigeon. To make this work the way Skinner did it was to starve the pigeon to 75% of its body weight when it was normally fed. That way we knew it was a very hungry pigeon, that it really wanted food. After that, all you have to do is reward the pigeon every time it does something you want. This could be any arbitrary behavior. If the pigeon pushes a lever, you give it a food pellet. If the pigeon hops or turns around in a circle, you give it a food pellet. If the pigeon lies down, you give it a food pellet. If it flaps its wings, you give it a food pellet. Any behavior you want to engender in the pigeon can be encouraged by giving it that food pellet. And you know it wants the food pellets because it's very, very hungry. That's how you use positive reinforcement on a pigeon. Now I'll have to talk about reward schedules and how they affect whether or not behavior is continued or extinguished. So imagine that every time you did something, you got a reward for it, and it was exactly the same reward. So let's say you wrote 500 words, and every time you wrote 500 words, you got a certain grade, and that was it. That would be a fixed ratio reward schedule, because then you'd be getting the same reward for doing the same kind of work. And if every time you did it, you got that same reward, it would remain fixed. There's another way to do a reward schedule, and that's called a variable ratio reward schedule. So sometimes maybe you'll write 500 words and you'll get top grades for that. But the next time you'll write 500 and you'll get a bit less. You'll get something that corresponds to kind of a 2-2. Then you know that you might have to write a bit more. So you keep writing until you write 750, you get a 2-1, you write 1,000, you get a first. And then you do that again. And this time you write 500, you write 750, you write 1,000. You have to write 1,500 before you get that same first grade again. So if that keeps happening, that makes you respond differently to the rewards. A variable ratio makes you actually do more things sometimes to get the same reward because you're not sure when the reward is coming. If you want to think of it in human terms, 
and think of it in terms of a gambling machine or a slot machine. Sometimes you put a coin in and you get some money. Sometimes you don't. And this actually keeps people addicted to it because they never know when that money is going to come and they think the next time might be the time that they get the reward for putting the coin in the machine. That's a very straightforward example of a variable ratio reward schedule. So that's a fixed ratio reward schedule and a variable ratio reward schedule. But there's another kind of reward schedule that's not really a reward schedule at all. And this is called a non-contingent reward schedule. Now what does that mean? It means exactly what it sounds like, non-contingent, meaning it's entirely unrelated to anything you've actually done. So you could imagine a situation in which sometimes you do something, and you get a result, sometimes you don't, you get a result, but it makes no difference whether you do the thing or not. A very human example would be a rain dance, in which people dance, but this dancing has no effect on the rain. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So there's actually a breakage between the behavior and the actual reward. That's a non-contingent reward schedule. In a Skinner box, this would mean that the pellets would just pop out at certain random times, no matter what the pigeon was doing, and that the pigeon would get the food schedules, whether it was doing a hop, or whether it was flapping its wings, or whether it was pressing the lever. So if you understand what a fixed ratio reward schedule is, and you understand what a variable ratio reward schedule is, and you understand what a non-contingent reward schedule is, what happens when you give a pigeon a non-contingent reinforcement schedule in a Skinner box? And the answer is very simple. The pigeon Sometimes, at least this is what B.F. Skinner observed, and independent raters also were able to observe and measure within very similar levels, is that the pigeon tends to mistake the non-contingent reinforcement schedule for a variable reinforcement schedule. What this means is that the pigeon believes that whatever it happened to be doing just before it got the pellet was the reason that it got the pellet. It made that link because one followed the other that one must have caused the other. So what did that mean in practical terms for B.S. Skinner? That meant that he could say very specific actions were being performed by pigeons in order to get more pellets, even though these actions had nothing to do with the pellets. One pigeon would develop kind of a tossing motion or a lifting motion of its head to one corner of the cage. It's kind of a pigeon doing this over and over again. One pigeon would hop on one foot. One pigeon would turn around in circles. So you could get pigeons doing little pellet dances much the same way people would do rain dances. And these pigeons seemed to really believe that this was the cause of the pellets. And they would keep doing this behavior, of course, until they got another pellet. At this point, I'm attributing a lot of cognition to a pigeon that probably can't really be justified. And B.F. Skinner didn't try to do the same thing. But it did seem as though the pigeon had decided, this hopping on one foot is what gets me the pellet. And I'm going to keep hopping on one foot until I got another pellet. Now, this works because eventually a pellet will come. And even though it had nothing to do with hopping on one leg, this is not something the pigeon will ever realize because it will keep hopping until it gets another one. So that's application of non-contingent reinforcement schedules to pigeons. And that's how you get a pigeon to be superstitious, to do the pigeon version of a rain dance. How does that translate to people, aside from the obvious example of rain dances? Well, humans happen to be in Skinner boxes all the time. Not real Skinner boxes, because that would be deeply unethical and worrying, but in other kinds of Skinner boxes. In every example I've given you outside of the pigeon example, I gave you an example of a person being encouraged to do something or discouraged from doing something. I gave you the example of the gambler who kept putting the coin into the machine, or the child who's being punished by the parent or rewarded by the parent. This is what happens to us every day. We get rewards for doing certain things. We get punishments for doing other things. And these cause our behaviors to continue or to be extinguished. So what happens to us when we mistake non-contingent reward schedules for variable ratio reward schedules? Then we become superstitious as well. A person then, just like the pigeon, believes that the reward it has received is dependent on whatever it was it was doing just before it received the reward. And this tendency gets stronger if the person is convinced of this relationship and then has a tendency to keep doing it until the thing works. There is an old joke that some people might not like for various legitimate reasons that asks the question, why do rain dances work? And the answer is, because they dance until it rains. That seems very funny, a slight on people who do rain dances, but this is true for everyone who engages in any kind of superstitious behavior. 
Now I'm going to possibly make a few enemies and ask you some troubling, controversial questions. Do you own any lucky charms? Is there a pendant that you carry with you? Is there a whistle that you blow at your favorite sports games? Do you pray? Do you try any kind of homeopathic medicine or any kind of crystal or alternative medicine? To be honest, we've done scientific tests on all of these things. and We've found that none of them actually have any effect on anything in the outside world. There is simply no relationship between doing these activities and getting the rewards you hope for. No matter how many times you blow that lucky whistle, it will not change the effect of the football match. No matter how many times you try these alternative methods, you will never actually heal anyone, or at least there doesn't appear to be a relationship between one and the other. But humans are very attached to all of these behaviors. And in a certain way, they work because we keep doing them until they work. We also mistake a non-contingent reward schedule for a variable ratio reward schedule. What should we do about this? The literature on superstition is actually quite mixed. And it shows that while severe superstition can be quite dangerous, slight superstitions can be somewhat helpful. That they can make us feel better about the world, and even though we know that they're not really helping, they give us a sense of control and lower our heart rates a bit. I'm not going to encourage you to be superstitious or not to be superstitious, but I am going to ask you, if you're interested in this kind of thing, to picture yourself as someone in a Skinner box, a very large and complicated Skinner box, and to ask you whether or not you're mistaking certain non-contingent reward schedules for variable ratio reward schedules. Hopefully, now you understand how to create superstition in a pigeon or in a human being. I'm Dr. Keon West from the Institute of Psychological Sciences at the University of Leeds. Thank you very much.